Isaiah 53, John 19. Isaiah 53, John 19. We, uh, we're going to take a look at the three. This is the fourth of the servant songs in Isaiah. We're coming to the conclusion of these five three-verse stanzas. And uh, today we're going to, I, I think we're going to finish Isaiah 53 today. Um, so let's stand for the reading of the word of the Lord. We're going to begin in Isaiah 53. At verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Now let's go to John 19. Picking up at verse 38, towards the end of John 19, verse 38. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus, and Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus, bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because, the Jews, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. Lord, we ask your blessing on the study of your word as we examine this messianic prophecy that you gave to Isaiah 700 years before Christ would be crucified. And you declared that his grave would be with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. And now we have John 19, 700 years later. And I pray, Lord, as we examine these passages of Scripture, that our hearts would be moved, our lives would be changed. And God, that you'd be glorified. We recognize you as our creator. We submit as your creatures. But more importantly, you don't call us servants. You call us friends. We're your children. You love us. You've redeemed us. You've delivered us. And you've come that we might have life and life more abundant. You experience death that we might experience life. And so, Lord, we're grateful. We ask that you would bless us now according to your riches in Christ and the truth and wisdom of your word, that you would lead us into that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, have a seat, please. So we're looking at this fourth stanza of three verses, and there's a fifth stanza. And the stanzas of this fourth servant song begins back in Isaiah 52 at the very end. It says, behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. And just as many were astonished at you, so his visage, his face was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them, they shall see, and what they had not heard, they shall consider. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, 
we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who will declare his generation? He was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear uh, their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors, of which all of us qualify. In this passage of scripture, we see the suffering servant, the servant song, the fourth of Isaiah's messianic prophecies. But this is such a depiction of Jesus Christ as we saw in last week's message with that video of the, uh, the Hebrew going through uh, Jerusalem modern day and interviewing. And this passage is no longer uh, read in the synagogues because it's so confusing to an Orthodox or conservative Jew or even a reformed Jew to see this and say, well, this declares a, a Messiah. And, and then as you read it, 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 it bears such resemblance to a suffering Messiah and the depiction of the crucifixion. And as you read Psalm 22, that they pierce my hands, they pierce my feet. And we, we go through this, anyone reading it says, this Messiah must suffer, he must suffer for the nations and for the sins of others. He must be put to death. And, and they read this and they acknowledge it as we saw, and, it, and it's, it's logical to come to that conclusion. And as we read it ourselves, we're touched by it to realize this was written 700 years before Christ was crucified. Psalm 22 is, was written uh, as, as long, if not longer, and talking about this idea of crucifixion, his hands and feet were pierced. When we get to the place where it says in verse seven, which we are looking at today, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as sheep before its shears is silent, he opened not his mouth. This is the silent suffering servant. In two cases, Isaiah repeats this by the, the spirit of the Lord, declaring that he didn't open his mouth. He didn't open his mouth as a lamb is silent before its shears is silent, as a sheep is before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. But it also says he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Interesting that as the crucifixion would be detailed, and as Isaiah 53 would depict the need for a Messiah that would suffer, it was an atoning death. Blood must be shed for the remission of sins, as we saw last week. It's the life force in the human body. When you're on death row and you've committed capital, uh, a capital offense, when you've committed murder, your, your life is required of you. No way at covenant, we can go through the picture of this in civil government that, that you don't take the life of somebody created in the image of God, ever. And if you do willfully and willingly, then you're in a place where you are guilty. Now, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that means that we have failed to honor what God has called us to do. There are none righteous, no, not one. And as we see all the world's religions, and you see all the world's religions as man trying to get to God by good works, right? Don't drink, smoke, or chew, or hang around with those who do. Christianity is not man trying to get to God by good works. Christianity is God coming to man and, and, and bridging that gap through justification, 
We've been justified because the price of our sin, the penalty of our sin has been paid. It's been paid. And, and as this is the case, that the bridge has been made between sinful man and a holy God, it's Christianity. Here's, here's the bullseye, here's the arrow, and where the arrow has fallen, that's called the sin distance, how far we've fallen from perfection. Christ, uh, the world's religions, we're always trying to hit the bullseye and we never can. Christianity is God moves the bullseye to where the arrow is. I mean, that's pretty cool. And, and we don't earn it, he gives it to us. And we don't do good works to be saved. We do, do good works because we are saved. It's not out of obligation, but out of adoration. You did that for me, I give you my life. You gave me your life, I give you mine. You love me this much, I love you this much. I wanna be crucified with Christ, that I die to myself and live to you. And this is, this is the secret and the, and the power of Christianity, that it's not an obligation, it's adoration. We don't try to serve a capricious God who is waiting to drop the other boot on us. He's merciful, patient, long-suffering, wanting that none would perish, but that all would be saved. But that comes at a price. Our sin is vile, it's awful. We saw the blood and we saw the misery of the sacrificial system. And I don't know if you read this week, but they've come up with a, a red heifer, the first time one born in Jerusalem and, or Israel in the longest of times. And those who have a pre-trib, pre-millennial eschatology are thinking, oh, the Lord's coming back. And they found the red heifer and they can set up the temple system and they can finally sacrifice to reestablish it. And I'm reading that, it's, it's kind of intense. Where were we? But regardless of our eschatology, one thing I do know is that there is no bull or lamb or any blood sacrifice that will suffice for my sins save but a holy man who is without sin who could die in my place. And there's only one that's ever fulfilled that, and that's Christ. But to pay the penalty for my sin would be horrific. And, and, and the Bible, you know, I think of the Apostle Paul who began his ministry by saying, I'm a sinner. And the very last epistle, the very last letter he ever wrote was 2 Timothy, and he said, I am the chief of sinners. I look at something like that and I think to myself, I think he would have improved. <laughs> yes? In me, Paul would write, in me, that is, in my flesh, dwells no good thing. He wrote that. The holy apostle Paul, Saint Paul. And, and, and as he said, I'm a sinner, and ends his life by saying I'm the chief of sinners, this is the reality. In me, in Rob McCoy, dwells no good thing. The only good thing in me is Jesus. And that's when I die. When I'm alive, it's awful. When I'm operating according to what I want, it is miserable. Ask my family, they live with me. Some of you go, I don't need to live with you. I've already experienced it. You see, for the Lord to die for me is awful. I know who I am. I, I came to church not because I wanted to better myself. I came to church because I wanted me to get out of the way. I have tried to better myself all through my life. And I'm sick of me. Whenever I'm involved, I make a mess of everything. I'm selfish, self-centered, self-consumed. Yes? Maybe you are all better than me. Well, you're prideful. <laughs> I came to church because I wanted less of me and more of him. I wanted to be around people that wanted less of themselves and more of him. Because when there's more of him, life is a lot better. Amen. But the price of that, the price of that, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. I think about those times where I, I yield to the Lord and I serve him. And with that comes affliction, like being humiliated in a service by the pastor when he shouldn't have. And it was wrong, and I'm sorry, and Vicky over there. Um, but I set it up because I wanted to use it as an illustration. George, you too. <laughs> I, 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 have, I have this gift of humiliation. But you, you think about this. When you're humiliated... And if the Bible says, I, Rob McCoy, have been crucified with Christ, can you hum humiliate a dead man? I mean, I've been to funerals, and there's the corpse, and it's awake, and you go up. You were ugly. 
I, I can't believe the outfit you're wearing. <laughs> they don't do anything. Just, you poke them. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Hang in there. <laughs> the idea is, Christ said in the Gospels, no man takes my life. I willingly lay it down. I willingly give it. And as he willingly gave it, he went before Pontius Pilate. He went before the Sanhedrin. He went before every ruler, every leader that was responsible for the judgment. And, and as he went before every one of them, he never opened his mouth. And as we went through some of the pictures and you saw them when they played the king's game, and we'll do this when we get to the Antonio Fortress in Israel, we'll be in, in the, the bowels of, of the city down below many levels of civilization where we'll be in the Antonio Fortress where they had Christ, where they played the king's game when they put the purple robe and the crown of thorns and they thrust a rod into his hands to, to, to mock him. And as they just beat him, We'll be down in that location. I'll take a bottle of water. I'll pour it over the granite and you will see the relief of the king's game appear in the stone. And you're, you're, it's one of those feelings where you're like, we're right where it happened. And as they beat him and they spit on him and they mocked him, he didn't say anything. Nothing. They, they ridiculed him. And as they, they put him on the post, and it was depicted fairly well, I think, historically speaking, in the Passion of the Christ, where they would wrap the arms around the post so the back was completely stretched and exposed, and then the cat of nine tails with the shards of metal or the shards of glass dipped in water so the leather would stick, the metal would dig in and rip the flesh out, and they did that, and they just, and, and when they did that, they did it for this reason. The Romans were whipping the accused for one reason. They wanted to know who else was complicit in the crime. Give me a name. And they would, they would whip you until you'd speak. And you know who was complicit in the crime? You know who was guilty? You and me. And he never uttered, he never uttered my name. He never gave me up. I was guilty as charged. And he endured this whipping where they would, they would expose the, the bone and at times from the back, even the bowels. And as this, this beating had occurred in the Antonio Fortress, this whipping occurred in the courtyard, as he's bleeding out, then they level on him a cross. And he has to go upwards on the Via Dolorosa. As people come out and slap him, others throw things at him, they mock him, they spit him, they spit on him. As he falls, they have Simon the Cyrene help with the cross. Do you realize that he's bleeding out? He's got to get to Golgotha, otherwise there's no atonement for you and me. He's not getting there. There would be no atonement if he doesn't get there. It is an act of sheer will to continue to traverse that hill while his flesh is exposed and is bleeding out. And as he gets to the top, and he's never opened his mouth, save but for one time, when I believe it was Pontius Pilate who invoked God the Father and said, you were under oath that's where he said, I am the Messiah. I am the king of the Jews. It is as you say. It's the only time he spoke when he was under oath. But he never gave you up and he never gave me up. And as a sheer act of will, and what was that will? The scripture says, because of the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. You remember his face was set like a flint. This was his calling. This was his duty. He gets up there. And they stretch out his arms. He's still not atoning for us yet. He's laying on the ground on this cross. 
And then the nail. Boom. One wrist. Boom. Nail. Second wrist. Nail in the feet. Nothing. And they lift him. And the weight. Can't breathe. He has to wait until the prophesied time. Holding on with everything he's got. And I've been by the bedside of a number of folks who have just willed themselves to die. And others who've willed themselves to stay alive until someone arrives that they have to speak to. I remember my mom. She fought to stay alive in order to reconcile with people. She couldn't breathe. And my mom's no Jesus. But it was pretty amazing to witness. And he opened on his mouth. When cows go to slaughter, they moo. When these animals are led to slaughter, when pigs, they squeal. But not lamb, not sheep. Even when they bring the knife to the jugular of the, of the lamb or the sheep, they say nothing. People say they're stupid. Well, it's fascinating to me that the Lord would pick them to describe himself. He opened not his mouth. He never gave you up. He never gave me up. He was taken from prison and judgment. Who will declare his generation? He was cut off from the land of the living, which just simply means he never had children. He was it. That bloodline is finished. And why? For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. He was paying atonement. His blood was covering our sins. It was washing us. But the part I want to look at, as overwhelming as what we've already seen is, is the picture that they had made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. And the reason why is because he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Whenever he opened his mouth, it was always true. Some of you will disqualify me as a pastor, but I, I had my 16-year-old son watch a show called Liar, Liar with Jim Carrey. And there's some very bad parts. <laughs> but the concept of not being able to lie, could you imagine what that would do for our world? How it would just transform, if, if we just started telling the truth. Even our facial expressions. I'm telling the truth. Well, can you, can you let your face know? <laughs> I'm really happy. Well, let your face know. And, and, and we're terrible at poker. Some of you are good, and you're good at poker because you're really good at lying. And they, they call it a tell. You can just read the face and you know something's up. My wife can look at me and... She knows. She just knows. So you're going, wow, pastor is... Yeah. I'm curious about your amazing family. That doesn't exist. Imagine if the world didn't lie. You just, you just knew the person you were talking to was telling you the truth. That's what we find in the church. Any, any pastor that counsels, the hardest thing to do is get to the truth. You have two people that are arguing with each other, and you listen to their story, you listen to their story. They both sound like they're both correct, and you just keep pushing it and writing it and going further and just going to the thread and finding where it is, and, and usually it unravels. But some people are so good because they've lived their whole life in deceit. I remember one man in particular that had, had, had served the church and was just fascinating as his heart to serve the church. And then one Christmas they were struggling and I get this letter from somebody he worked with and, and, and they were talking about what an amazing guy he was and how he'd given his last dime and how he'd done it at that. And he shared this. And it was such a profound letter. I was moved by it to the point where it was Christmas time and I knew they were struggling and, and we had a limited amount of discretionary funds and I, I gave the family some money 
because this letter of somebody that had been touched by their life, and I thought, what a servant, and I sent the family money, and, and it was myself and Eric Smith, who was an assistant pastor at the time, he's our worship leader, and, and it's after Christmas, just before New Year's, I'm driving down Lynn Road to go to the church, and as I'm driving down, the Lord speaks to my heart, and it was almost audible. Some of you are going, something's wrong with him. I'm just telling you, it was that clear, and the Lord said, that letter was fake. He wrote it. I'm like, no way, God. There's, Father, there's no way he could have. No, he wrote it. No, no. And it's just, yes. And I pick up the phone and I call Eric and I go, Eric, I got to tell you, the Lord just spoke to my heart. He said, so did he, he spoke to mine. What did he tell you? He said that so-and-so wrote the letter. He goes, that's what he told me. So he confronted him. I did write the letter. And then I started to press him a little bit. And he'd been lying his whole life. He didn't even know he was lying that he was lying. He had convinced himself. And then you come to this place. We're wicked. We're all awful. We, we all have issues. We've all lied. We've all cheated. We've all stolen. And you say, no, I haven't. You're lying. <laughs> because he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. And some of you say, I've never done violence. You haven't done violence maybe with your fist, but you sure have with your words. Gossip, slander, flattery, they're all deceptive. And they destroy, they're cancerous, they hurt people. I, I, I know because I am so good at it. And so are you. All we like sheep have gone astray, but not the Lord. Fascinating to me that they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. When you do a funeral, people want the room to be full. And, and I've shared this many times, Ecclesiastes 7, when a good name is like a precious fragrance, better is the day of a man's death than the day of his birth. You're given a name when you're born, and we only know at the end of your life whether it's a fragrance or a stench. Nobody's naming their children Ted Bundy or Adolf Hitler. Or maybe somebody's named Jezebel, but you really have to talk to your parents. <laughs> right? These are names that, that through history, we've kind of just said, that's probably not good, right? But we think of other names that are a fragrance. They just bring pleasant recollection. And that's why, that, that's why Solomon was so wise as he used synesia. He combined two senses to bring across a, a word picture. He said a good name is like a precious fragrance. So, so you have the sense of smell, the olfactory sense, which is a number one sense of memory recollection tied to a name so that when people come to a funeral and I see the room packed, they're drawn by one thing, the name. And that name has been a fragrance to their life because they've been the fragrance of Christ. They, as it says in Corinthians, we are the fragrance of Christ. To some, the aroma of death. To others, the aroma of life. They're drawn by the way we've served humanity and they come in droves. And I've done funerals where nobody's in the room. And I've done funerals where it's standing room only. And, and we've contributed to society and we've helped and we've done, but we all know that at the end of the day, when we look in that mirror, we know who we are. We've tried to deceive ourselves and we can purchase people to come because they're waiting for the will to be read and we can, we can get a room filled with people if we've got that kind of money. And I think of the story of the two brothers that were vile and evil and the entire town hated them and they were the richest and they had cheated everybody and stole from everybody. And, and one of the brothers dies and he goes to the priest and he says, I'm gonna give a you know, million dollars to build the church but the one thing before I give that money is you have to promise me that you're gonna call my brother a saint. And the priest just says, he is anything but a saint. He's hurt everybody in this town. Okay, then you won't get a million. The priest says, well, it's a million bucks. <laughs> All right, I'll do it. He says, you will. He says, you have my word. And he writes the check and he hands it to him. The priest gets up. And he begins by saying of the living brother, he points to him. He says, this man here is the biggest thief in the town. And the man looks at him like, what are you? And he goes through this whole thing. He says, he's cheated everyone. He's lied. He's hurt folks. He's, he's, he's awful. But compared to his brother, he's a saint. <laughs> and he cashed the check. Where will we be buried? With the poor, with the rich? It's a tombstone. It's like a flower of the field here today, gone tomorrow. Who will come to our, our funeral? We're not going to be there to really know. 
But how will we be remembered? Is our name a fragrance or a stench? But the part that amazes me is what we read in John 19. After this, after this is what we've read that was prophesied 700 years before, but after, after the beatings, after the Via Dolorosa, after the nails in the wrists, after being put on the cross, after being mocked, after being speared in the side, crown of thorns, blood pouring out. After all of that, after he had said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When not just the immensity of my sins, but the, the combined sins of the world for generations to come and those that have yet to even happen are poured upon the Messiah. And the father is, is, is separated and he's left with all of this. And the only words he utters at the cross is Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then he finishes with three Greek words, one in the English, to telestai. Excuse me, three in the English, one in the Greek, to telestai. It's what happens when you pay the mortgage. They said paid in full. And you get that last sheet and you dance. And when Jesus said to telestai, he said it is finished. The atonement has been made. And he breathed his last and out of sheer will that was holding on as we had shredded him, marred him more than any man, he breathed his last and he paid the price. And there his corpse, shredded and beaten, abused and marred by evil hands, Jackals starting to surround, and we think the cross was high up. It wasn't high. It was low enough that they would typically eat the legs. Nicodemus, who had come to Jesus at night, was one of the Sanhedrin. Joseph of Arimathea was not only one of the Sanhedrin, but he was the third wealthiest man in all of Jerusalem, all of Israel. It was said that his daughter's wedding was the most lavish wedding they'd ever witnessed as we read Jewish history. This man had money. Lots of it. But he contended with the Sanhedrin that this is unacceptable. He contended saying, this is a righteous man. He, he did not agree with the findings. Nicodemus came at night and he said, we know that you were a prophet sent from God. He had the conversation about being born again where we had the verse, John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should, or whomever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Nicodemus heard these. He was moved by that to the point where he wouldn't come to Jesus at night. It says here that he came during the day and he's quoted in John. But Joseph of Arimathea, the rich man that is declared in the passage of scripture that we read in verse nine, that he would be buried with the rich. It was this man, Joseph of Arimathea, four times in the gospels, all four gospels have an account of this fellow named Joseph of Arimathea being a disciple of Jesus but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. He went to Pilate. He said, I want his body. You know what that means? It means that he's going to be unclean, and he'll miss the Passover, the high holiday of the Jewish festival. He will be unclean because he's touched a dirt, uh, 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 an unclean body, a corpse. And he goes, and he... There's different accounts, but they say that he wrapped his arms in linens while they lovingly pulled the nails out and they could lower him. This is the, the garden tomb. It's called, um, oh, something Calvary. What, what's the, the, the officer's name? Gordon's Calvary. This is called Gordon's Calvary. It's, it's different than the site of the Holy Sepulchre. This is where we take communion the last day in Israel. We're going to go from May 1st to the 10th this, this coming year. And we go to Gordon's Calvary, and it's one of the most beautiful places in all of Israel. And you see a, a place that would, would seem to be Mount Golgotha, the place of the skull. And you see this is a rich man's area. You, you see that they have not only a well, but a cistern. They've got uh, uh, a place to, to, to grind the olives and to, to grind the, the grapes. It, it, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful, wealthy man's home. 
and there is this massive stone that they found, and here is a rich man's tomb. Two parts of the tomb have not been completed. One was for a child, the other was for uh, another adult. Those had not been hewn, and they were done by hand. They didn't have pneumatic tools. This was paid for by a wealthy man, and as you go in, it is very apparent that there is only one area for burial, and they believe this to be where Christ was buried. This is a tomb of the Holy Sepulchre, which is argued over by uh, a multitude of denominations, including the Armenian Orthodox Church, uh, the Catholic Church, the Russian Orthodox Church. And they, they argue back and forth. For example, that's the entrance in the lower left. But up here, as you can see, it's circled above and over to the right is this ladder that's been there for 300 years. Because all of these denominations can't agree on who's going to move the ladder. One person tried to remove it in the 90s and they were arrested and it was put back. They, they can't even argue who gets to open the door. So they have a Muslim open the door to the tomb of the Holy Sepulchre. Here's the ladder. That, that's during photographic times. And that's not a modern picture. This is the tomb of the Holy Sepulchre, and it's just, it's a wash and incense and, and people kissing floors, and it's, it's just, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's anything but peaceful. It's, it's kind of chaotic, and I don't say that to dis, dismiss um, my Catholic brothers and sisters or my Armenian Orthodox brothers and sisters or Russian Orthodox. I say that because it just, for me, doesn't work. And Gordon's Calvary, I can't prove that that's the location, but what I can say is, the Lord was buried, and it was Joseph of Arimathea who asked for his body. And to ask for his body from Pilate was very dangerous, because all of a sudden, all the Sanhedrin know he's aligned with Jesus, the Galilean. You see, Joseph of Arimathea being a disciple of Jesus... you see that? He's a disciple of Jesus. He was secretly for fear of the Jews, but now he's public. He's public and he puts his life on the line. He went to Pilate. He said, give me permission. This man had money. I imagine Pilate said, what are you doing? You're, you're, you're going to ruin your business. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came with him. Joseph and Nicodemus, they both come. And they bring a mixture of myrrh and aloes and 100 pounds. And then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. It also says in the other gospel accounts, real simply, that they washed the body. They take the body down. This is, um, this is what it means to wash the body. And I want to share this with you. It's uh, this idea of a takrahim. It's, it's the Jewish burial. They wrap the body in linens with spices and aloes. Tahura ritual, the cleansing of the dead. Tachrahim is the dressing the body according to ritual law. These are the cornerstones of Jewish burial performed by the Chavra Kadesh, or however you pronounce it, or Holy Society. It's a group of trained volunteers who in traditional Jewish communities prepare the dead and support the mourners through the prescribed grieving process. And it's a holy act because to do this, you can't participate in anything because you've become unclean. And so they say, I willingly avail myself to prepare the body. I will not be at the funeral or the services because I'll be unclean, but I will, I will be used for this purpose. And it's a, it's a selfless act. And this is, this is what Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus do. The greatest Passover in the history of the world, and they choose to be defiled to care for the body. It's the cleansing of the dead, the dressing of the body according to ritual law. 
in silence, the members of this temple, Beth El, and I was reading about it, begin their work carefully cleaning the body, slowly pouring water over it, while saying in ritual words, lovingly wrapping it in a a clean white shroud, reverently placing it finally into a simple pine coffin. The only sounds are the dripping of water and the women's whispered prayers because if it's a male body, it's the men that come and do this. If it's a female body, it's the women who come and do this. But it's more than that. As as I recount one picture in particular or or one account in particular, a woman speaking of her father, her last name was Cohen, and she said she was behind the curtain as the men brought her father into this Tak Rahim in, in this ha, Havra Kadesh, and they, they, they put the body of Mr. Cohen down, and they begin to wash him and comb his hair. They say, Mr. Cohen, we're going to comb your hair now. Mr. Cohen, we're going to be washing your back now. Mr. Cohen, we'll be praying for you now. Imagine Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. Jesus, we're going to be cleaning your wounds now. As they were taking the dirt out of his gashes in his head. Jesus, we're going to be cleaning your side now. We're going to be cleaning your hands, your feet. Jesus, we're going to be caring for your face as they have just pulled your beard out. And as they're cleaning the wounds in his hand, the scriptures that they all knew is Sanhedrin. Psalm 22, my hands have pierced, my feet they've pierced. Isaiah 53, my beard they pulled from my face. As they do this cleansing, they they say, Jesus, we're gonna roll you over now. what they saw. We're, we're going to clean these wounds tenderly and lovingly as they place aloes and oils. By his stripes we've been healed. Each of these wounds, they, they're reminiscent of a scripture. Their hearts are moved. But here, he's dead. They are putting their life on the line for a dead man. Their lives are finished. But they love him. They care for the king's body. They remember this, so his visage was marred more than any man. They pierced my hands and my feet. By his stripes we are healed. Can you imagine rolling him over and seeing that back and saying, he was wounded for my transgressions. They did this to you because of me. And I I, I wanna care for you. And they love him and they, they tenderly care for his body as they speak to him as he's always present. Instead of of Joseph of Arimathea, covered by, I think it's Josephus, who said, the most extravagant wedding of the wealthiest or one of the wealthiest men in all of Israel. His daughter was found picking barley out of horse stables because they were so impoverished. Their family lost everything after this. They lost it all. It was Gamaliel who had contended in the book of Acts saying, if this is of Christ, then leave it alone. If it isn't, it'll fall on its own. Gamaliel was best friends with Joseph of Arimathea. And it's said that when he lost everything, when Joseph lost everything, Gamaliel brought him into his home what's interesting to me is after this entire event 
and this sacred washing of the body of Christ, it said that an earthquake hit. The veil was torn from top to bottom. The dead rose. The light was shining. It was just intense. We don't know if it's because Jesus went up or the angel came down, but it, it was unbelievable. And the, the tomb was empty. And witnessing the resurrected body, can you imagine what Joseph felt? Can you imagine what Nicodemus felt when they realized those are the hands I washed? That's the back I cleansed. That's the head that I cared for. This, was, this, this is what I had given my life to. I'll tell you what, that Resurrection Sunday meant more to him than anyone else in the room. He was so moved that not only did he lose everything, but church tradition goes on to say that he's the one who became Joseph of Glastonbury. What is this? It's a church in England. He became the Bishop of England. He brought Christianity, where most of us are probably of that descent. In Glastonbury, they, they say it's no longer Joseph of Arimathea, it's Joseph of Glastonbury. Of course, the Abbey's destroyed as England is in a postmodern spiral. And I think, what would Joseph of Arimathea have to say to the church today? You were a rich man. How do we make money in the church? You were a successful religious leader who was the third wealthiest in all of Israel. How do we, how do, we do a, a, a growth program, a tithe program? How do we generate wealth in the body of Christ? He would look at them and he'd say, stop it. No. No. Let me tell you about his wounds. Let me tell you about the love. Let me tell you about the eyes that I looked into. The face that was radiant. The, the life that was redeemed. Mine because of him. You see... If Joseph of Arimathea could say something to us today, he'd say, what we did for a dead Jesus, we did for a dead Jesus, we did what we did for a dead Jesus, but you have a risen and living Jesus. I don't think the church realizes that. Our God is alive. He lost everything for a dead Jesus, not knowing if he'd resurrect. And ours is alive, and the tomb is empty. The prophecy is fulfilled. And I tire of the apathy in my own life. I tire of the apathy. Of my devotion life. I tire of the constant presence of Christ. Not present. In areas that he needs to be. That's inventory of my life. How about yours? He's alive. Would you put it all on the line for a living God? Like Joseph did for a dead Jesus. Is there, is there tenderness and love that you would care for a lifeless body? Knowing you'd lose everything when we have the ability to lay our life down for a living God? What is it that's so much more precious in this passing world that we wouldn't want anything to get in the way of the world seeing this resurrected Savior. 
Verse 9 pierces my heart. He wasn't buried with a rich man because he was rich. He was buried with a rich, in a rich man's tomb because a rich man became poor. That's why. A rich man became poor and gave up that which he couldn't keep to gain that which he could never lose. We have a good God and amazing brothers and sisters who have set the standard before us so we don't have to be afraid anymore. I am so moved by Isaiah 53. I pray that the life of Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, what they were willing to do, and they did what they did for a dead Jesus, we all would be moved to do for a living one. And I have to say, I'm inspired by so many of you because I see that selfless heart. You put it all on the line. This is, this is a high and noble calling. There'll be challenges, no doubt. There'll be threats. But what a wonderful privilege. We get to do this. We don't have to. We get to. So... As we prepare to move to this place that God has given us, there's a lot of folks up there that are not wanting you there. And all of us have the get to, to go love on them. And we're going to keep our mouths shut when we're insulted. We're not going to be bitter, we're not going to respond when we're reviled. This is our passage for our move. And this is from the Lord. So I pray God blesses us all for this wonderful calling in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Such a heavy passage and I struggle revisiting it, but I'm grateful for the comfort we received. You didn't open your mouth as a lamb is silent to the slaughter. A sheep before it shears is silent. You open not your mouth. But Lord, you made your grave with the wicked, but the rich in your death because you had no violence. There was no deceit in your mouth. And we're your children. And we, like Joseph of Arimathea, are your disciples. And you're alive. And we want our lives to be for your service. And so, Lord, thank you for the calling that we have as the body of Christ. Lord, I thank you for the men and women who love you and nothing hinders them from serving you. And so, Lord, we praise you this day. Thank you for your word. And Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice that has set us free from the law of sin and death by the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. We commit our lives to you afresh, and we thank you for the gift of this building, for your glory. We don't move in for the sake of comfort. We move in to minister to all you call us to touch. And though we be reviled, we will revile not. And Lord, we won't be insulted or hurt. We're just going to love. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.